I'm glad you could join us. Go ahead and stab the like button and stick around for the next untold story. In the quiet suburb of Maplewood, Ohio, the residents prided themselves on their close-knit community and low crime rate. It was the kind of place where neighbors knew each other by name and children played outside until dusk without a care in the world. But in the winter of 2018, the tranquility of Maplewood was shattered by a series of chilling home invasions that left the community on edge. Lisa and Mark Johnson had moved to Maplewood two years prior, drawn by the promise of safety and a good environment for their two young children, Emily and Jake. Their charming two-story house on Elm Street seemed like the perfect place to raise a family. Little did they know, it would become the setting for their worst nightmare. It was a cold December evening and the Johnsons were settling in for the night. Lisa was in the kitchen, washing the last of the dinner dishes, while Mark sat in the living room, engrossed in a book. Emily and Jake were already tucked into bed, their soft snores drifting down the hall. Lisa glanced at the clock, 10.30 p.m. She dried her hands and turned off the kitchen light, ready to join Mark for a quiet evening. As she walked into the living room, she noticed something strange. The front door, which she was certain she had locked, was slightly ajar. Mark, did you leave the door open? She asked, her voice tinged with concern. Mark looked up from his book, frowning. No, I locked it after I let the dog out. Are you sure it's open? Lisa nodded, her heart beginning to race. She walked over to the door and slowly pushed it shut, checking the lock twice. Just as she turned away, a loud crash echoed from the back of the house. The sound of shattering glass made her blood run cold. Mark, what was that? She whispered, fear gripping her. Mark stood up his face pale. Stay here with the kids. I'll go check it out. He grabbed a baseball bat from the hall closet and cautiously made his way towards the noise. Lisa followed a few steps behind, unable to stay put. As they reached the kitchen, they saw the source of the crash. The back door window was broken, glass scattered across the floor. Before they could react, a dark figure emerged from the shadows, lunging at Mark. He swung the bat, but the intruder was quick, dodging the blow and knocking Mark to the ground. Lisa screamed, rushing to her husband's side, but the intruder grabbed her by the arm, his grip like a vice. Don't make a sound, he hissed, his face obscured by a black ski mask. Do exactly as I say, and no one gets hurt. Terror washed over Lisa as she nodded, her mind racing. She glanced at Mark, who was struggling to get up, a look of helpless rage on his face. The intruder forced them into the living room, where another masked figure stood, holding a knife. Where are the kids? The second intruder demanded, his voice cold and menacing. Lisa's heart pounded in her chest. They're asleep upstairs. Please don't hurt them. The intruder sneered. We'll see about that. Take us to the safe. We don't have a safe, Mark said, his voice steady despite the fear in his eyes. Take whatever you want. Just leave us alone. The intruders exchanged a glance. Then the one holding Lisa tightened his grip. You're lying. We know you have one. Show us, or we go upstairs and wake the kids. Panic surged through Lisa. They didn't have a safe, but the thought of these men near her children was unbearable. Please, we really don't have one. Take the jewelry, the cash, anything you want. The second intruder sighed, frustrated. Fine. Empty your pockets, both of you. As Mark and Lisa complied, the first intruder kept his knife trained on them. They handed over their wallets, phones, and any valuables they had on them. The intruders gathered everything into a bag, but the atmosphere grew more tense by the second. Suddenly, a faint cry came from upstairs. Jake had woken up. The intruder's head snapped towards the sound, and Lisa's heart dropped. Please, he's just a child, she begged. The second intruder gestured to his partner. Go check it out. Make sure the kid stays quiet. As the first intruder headed for the stairs, Mark saw an opportunity. He lunged at the second intruder, wrestling him for the knife. Lisa screamed as the two men struggled, knocking over furniture in their battle. The first intruder turned back, rushing to help his partner. In the chaos, Lisa grabbed a lamp and swung it at the first intruder, hitting him hard. He stumbled, and Mark managed to wrest the knife from the second intruder's hand. Breathing heavily, Mark stood over the two intruders, the knife in his hand shaking. Get out of my house, he growled, his voice filled with fury. The intruders scrambled to their feet and ran, 
disappearing into the night. Lisa rushed to Mark, pulling him into a tight embrace. Are you okay? She whispered, tears streaming down her face. Mark nodded, holding her close. We need to call the police. Lisa grabbed the house phone, dialing 911 with trembling hands. As she spoke to the dispatcher, she heard the sound of sirens in the distance. The police arrived quickly, securing the house and taking statements from the shaken family. Detective Thompson, a stern-looking officer with a kind voice, assured them that they would do everything possible to catch the intruders. You're lucky, he said. These men have been hitting houses in the area for weeks. You're the first to fight back. As the police processed the scene, Lisa and Mark sat together on the couch, holding each other tightly. They knew that their sense of safety had been shattered, but they were grateful to be alive. The next few days were a blur of police interviews and sleepless nights. The community rallied around the Johnsons, offering support and helping to repair the damage to their home. But the fear lingered, and the sound of breaking glass haunted Lisa's dreams. One evening, as Lisa was tucking Emily and Jake into bed, she heard a soft tapping at the window. Her heart raced as she approached, but there was nothing there. She tried to shake off the feeling of dread, but it clung to her like a shadow. Downstairs, Mark was installing new locks on the doors and windows. He looked up as Lisa entered the room, her face pale. What's wrong? He asked, concerned. I heard something at the window, she whispered. I thought, I thought they might be back. Mark pulled her into a comforting hug. It's okay. The police are keeping an eye on the house. We're safe. But Lisa couldn't shake the feeling that something was still out there, watching them. That night, she lay awake, listening to every creak and groan of the house, her mind racing with fear. As the weeks passed, the intruders were never caught, and the community of Maplewood remained on edge. The Johnsons tried to move on, but the memory of that night lingered, a constant reminder of how quickly their lives had been turned upside down. One cold January evening, as Lisa was getting ready for bed, she heard the tapping again. This time, it was louder, more insistent. She froze, her heart pounding, and called for Mark. Mark came rushing in, a concerned look on his face. Did you hear that? Lisa nodded, her eyes wide with fear. It's coming from the basement. Mark grabbed the baseball bat and led the way downstairs, Lisa following close behind. The tapping grew louder as they approached the basement door. Mark took a deep breath and opened the door, his grip tightening on the bat. They descended the stairs slowly, the tapping echoing through the dark, cold space. As they reached the bottom, they saw a figure standing in the shadows. The light from their flashlight revealed a man, his face twisted into a sinister smile. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Mark, the man said, his voice dripping with malice. Did you miss me? Lisa gasped, recognizing the voice. It was one of the intruders from that night. Her blood ran cold as she realized he had returned to finish what he had started. Mark stepped forward brandishing the bat. Get out of my house, he growled. The intruder laughed, the sound sending chills down their spines. I'm afraid I can't do that. You see, I've been waiting for the right moment to come back. And now, here we are. Lisa backed away, her mind racing. She needed to protect her children, to get them out of the house. But the intruder was blocking the stairs, his eyes gleaming with malevolence. You won't get away this time, the intruder said, advancing towards them. Mark swung the bat, but the intruder dodged the blow and lunged at him, knocking the bat from his hands. Lisa screamed as the two men grappled, the basement filled with the sounds of their struggle. In a moment of desperation, Lisa grabbed a heavy toolbox and hurled it at the intruder. It hit him squarely in the back, and he stumbled, giving Mark the chance to regain his footing. With a fierce determination, Mark tackled the intruder to the ground, pinning him down. Call the police, Mark shouted, his voice strained. Lisa ran upstairs, her hands shaking as she dialed 911. The operator assured her that help was on the way, but Lisa ran upstairs, her hands shaking as she dialed 911. The operator assured her that help was on the way, but every second felt like an eternity. She could hear the sounds of the struggle continuing below, Mark grunting with effort as he tried to subdue the intruder. Just as she hung up the phone, she heard a chilling scream from the basement. Her heart pounding, she grabbed a kitchen knife and rushed back down, terrified of what she might find. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, she saw Mark lying on the floor, blood seeping from a wound in his side. The intruder was standing over him, a cruel smile on his face, holding the baseball bat. 
No! Lisa screamed, rushing forward with the knife. She slashed wildly at the intruder, her fear and rage giving her strength. The man dodged her initial attacks but was caught off guard by her ferocity. She managed to cut his arm, and he howled in pain, dropping the bat. Mark, struggling to his feet, joined Lisa in attacking the intruder. Together, they managed to push him back, but he was strong and relentless. The fight moved around the basement, knocking over shelves and boxes, the confined space amplifying the chaos. Just as they seemed to be gaining the upper hand, the intruder pulled a gun from his waistband. He aimed it at Lisa, his eyes filled with cold malice. Enough, he hissed. This ends now. Before Lisa could react, a shot rang out. She felt a searing pain in her shoulder and fell to the ground, clutching the wound. Mark roared in fury and tackled the intruder again, but the man was ready. He twisted and fired another shot, hitting Mark in the chest. Lisa watched in horror as Mark collapsed, blood pooling around him. The intruder stood over them, breathing heavily, his face a mask of rage and satisfaction. You should have just stayed quiet, he said, his voice eerily calm. Desperation and fear surged through Lisa. She knew she had to protect her children at all costs. Summoning her remaining strength, she lunged at the intruder, the knife still in her hand. She managed to stab him in the side, and he staggered back, cursing. Suddenly, the sound of sirens filled the air, growing louder as they approached. The intruder's eyes widened with realization and anger. He turned to flee, but the pain from his wounds slowed him down. Lisa crawled towards Mark, her vision blurring from the pain and blood loss. Mark, stay with me, she whispered, tears streaming down her face. Help is coming. Mark's eyes flickered open, filled with pain but also determination. I love you, Lisa, he rasped, his voice weak. Protect the kids. The basement door burst open, and police officers stormed in, weapons drawn. The intruder tried to fight back, but he was quickly overpowered and subdued. Paramedics rushed to Lisa and Mark, working frantically to stabilize them. As Lisa was lifted onto a stretcher, she felt her consciousness fading. The last thing she saw was the intruder being led away in handcuffs, his face twisted in anger. She knew that they had survived, but the cost had been high. The days that followed were a blur of hospital rooms and pain. Mark had survived, but his injuries were severe. Lisa's shoulder wound would heal, but the psychological scars would take much longer to mend. The community of Maplewood rallied around them, offering support and comfort but the sense of safety they had once felt was shattered. Despite their ordeal, Lisa and Mark vowed to rebuild their lives and protect their children. They knew that the darkness that had invaded their home would always linger in their memories, but they were determined to find light and hope in each other and their family. But some nights, when the house was quiet and the world seemed at peace, Lisa would hear a faint, rhythmic tapping. Her heart would race, and she would remember the terror of that night knowing that the darkness had left a permanent mark on their lives. And though they had survived, the shadow of fear and violence would always be a part of their story, a chilling reminder that safety could be shattered in an instant. The nightmare had ended, but its echoes would never truly fade, leaving Lisa and her family forever changed by the horror they had endured. In the small, picturesque town of Pleasant Grove, Texas, crime was almost unheard of. It was the kind of place where people left their doors unlocked, neighbors watched out for each other, and everyone felt a sense of security. But in the summer of 2015, the town's tranquility was shattered by a terrifying home invasion that left lasting scars on those involved. The Thompson family, John, his wife Sarah, and their teenage daughter Emma, lived in a charming Victorian house on the edge of town. They had moved to Pleasant Grove three years earlier, seeking a peaceful place to raise Emma. John was a high school teacher, and Sarah worked part-time at the local library. Their lives were happy and uneventful, until one fateful night in July. It was a warm, muggy evening, and the Thompsons had just returned home from a family barbecue. After putting away leftovers and chatting about the day, they settled into their usual evening routines. John went to his study to grade papers, Sarah curled up on the couch with a book, and Emma retreated to her room to listen to music. Around 11 p.m., Sarah decided to call it a night. She kissed John goodnight and headed upstairs. As she passed Emma's room, she knocked gently on the door. Don't stay up too late, honey, she said. I won't, Mom. Good night, Emma replied, her voice muffled by the music. 
Sarah smiled and went to bed, unaware that this would be the last moment of peace they would experience for a long time. At around 2 a.m., John was jolted awake by a loud crash downstairs. His first thought was that it might be the cat, but as he listened, he heard hushed voices and the sound of footsteps. His heart raced as he realized someone had broken into their home. He shook Sarah awake and whispered urgently, Sarah, someone's in the house. Stay here with Emma. I'm going to check it out. No, John, don't go, Sarah pleaded, her eyes wide with fear. I have to. Lock the door and call 911, he instructed, grabbing the baseball bat he kept under the bed. John crept down the stairs, his heart pounding in his chest. As he reached the bottom, he saw two figures moving through the living room, their faces obscured by ski masks. They were ransacking the place, pulling drawers out and tossing items aside. Hey! John shouted, hoping to scare them off. The intruders froze for a moment, then turned towards him. One of them pulled out a gun and pointed it at John. Don't move, the intruder growled, his voice cold and menacing. John's mind raced. He knew he had to protect his family, but he was outnumbered and outgunned. Take whatever you want, just leave my family alone, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. The second intruder sneered. Oh, we plan to. But first, we need you to cooperate. Where's the safe? We don't have a safe, John replied, his hands trembling. The intruder with the gun stepped closer, pressing the barrel against John's forehead. I don't believe you. You're going to show us where it is, or we'll find your family and make them show us. John's blood ran cold. He had to think fast. Okay, okay, it's in the study. I'll show you. The intruders followed him to the study, the gun never leaving his head. As they entered the room, John tried to think of a way to alert Sarah and Emma without putting them in more danger. He pointed to a locked cabinet. The safe's in there. The second intruder moved to the cabinet, keeping a close eye on John. Open it. John fumbled with the keys, trying to stall for time. He hoped the police would arrive soon, but he had no way of knowing if Sarah had managed to call them. As he unlocked the cabinet, he glanced at the phone on his desk, considering his options. Suddenly, the sound of sirens filled the air. The intruders tensed, and the one with the gun grabbed John by the arm. You called the cops? You're going to regret that. Before John could react, the intruder struck him on the head with the gun. Pain exploded in his skull, and he fell to the floor, his vision swimming. The last thing he saw before losing consciousness was the intruders fleeing through the back door. When John awoke, he was in a hospital bed, his head bandaged. Sarah and Emma were beside him, their faces etched with worry and relief. John, thank God you're okay, Sarah said, tears streaming down her face. What happened? John asked, his voice weak. The police arrived just in time. The intruders got away, but they didn't hurt us. You're a hero, John. You saved us, Sarah said, squeezing his hand. Over the next few days, the Thompsons tried to piece their lives back together. The police investigated the break-in, but the intruders were never caught. The sense of safety and security they had once felt in their home was shattered. John struggled with headaches and nightmares, reliving the terror of that night. Sarah and Emma also found it difficult to sleep, every creak and rustle in the house filling them with dread. They installed a security system and reinforced the doors and windows, but the fear lingered. One night, as John sat in the study, trying to grade papers, he heard a faint tapping at the window. His heart raced as he looked up, but there was nothing there. He tried to shake off the feeling of unease, but it clung to him like a shadow. As the weeks turned into months, the Thompsons tried to move on, but the trauma of the home invasion remained. They attended therapy sessions and leaned on each other for support, but the sense of vulnerability was hard to shake. On a stormy night in October, just as the Thompsons were beginning to feel a semblance of normalcy, the power went out. The house was plunged into darkness, and the familiar hum of appliances was replaced by the sound of rain and thunder. John grabbed a flashlight and headed to the basement to check the circuit breaker. Sarah and Emma stayed in the living room, huddled together under a blanket. As John descended the stairs, the flashlight flickered, casting eerie shadows on the walls. He reached the circuit breaker and flipped the switches, but the power didn't come back on. Frustrated, he turned to head back upstairs, but stopped when he heard a faint noise, a tapping sound, coming from somewhere in the basement. John's heart pounded as he shone the flashlight around, searching for the source of the noise. The tapping grew louder, more insistent. It seemed to be coming from behind a stack of old boxes. 
He moved the boxes aside, revealing a small hidden door he had never noticed before. The tapping continued, and John felt a chill run down his spine. Taking a deep breath, he opened the door. Inside was a narrow, dark passageway that seemed to lead into the very foundation of the house. The tapping was louder now, echoing through the confined space. John hesitated, then stepped inside, determined to find out what was causing the noise. As he ventured deeper into the passageway, the air grew colder and the tapping became more frantic. He reached the end of the passage and found himself in a small underground room. In the center of the room stood a figure, its back turned to him, tapping rhythmically on the wall. Who's there? John demanded, his voice trembling. The figure turned slowly, revealing a familiar face, the face of one of the intruders from that night. The man's eyes were cold and empty, and a sinister smile played on his lips. You didn't think you could get rid of me that easily, did you? John stumbled back, his mind racing. How could this be possible? The man had never been caught, but he shouldn't be here, in his house. What do you want? John asked, his voice barely above a whisper. The intruder stepped closer, the smile never leaving his face. I want you to remember. I want you to live in fear, just like that night. John felt a surge of anger and fear. Get out of my house, he shouted, lunging at the intruder. But as he reached out, the intruder vanished, leaving only the echo of his sinister laughter. The tapping resumed, louder and more insistent than ever. John stumbled back up the stairs, his heart pounding. When he reached the living room, Sarah and Emma were waiting, their faces pale with fear. John, what's happening? Sarah asked, her voice shaking. I don't know, John replied, his mind racing. But we need to get out of here, now. <laughs> they grabbed their coats and rushed out of the house into the stormy night. As they drove away, John glanced back at the house, its dark windows staring back at him like empty eyes. The tapping sound followed them, echoing in his mind. The Thompsons moved in with relatives while they decided what to do. They knew they couldn't go back to that house, but the fear and trauma followed them. The tapping sound, the sinister figure, the sense of being watched, it all haunted their every waking moment. Despite their efforts to move on, the memory of that night and the horrors that followed never truly left them. The house on Elm Street remained empty, a silent witness to the terror that had unfolded within its walls. And though the Thompsons tried to rebuild their lives, the shadow of fear and violence hung over them, a constant reminder that safety could be shattered in an instant. The nightmare had ended, but its echoes would never truly fade, leaving them forever changed by the horror they had endured. The Thompson family moved in with Sarah's sister, Ellen, while they tried to make sense of what had happened and figure out their next steps. Ellen's house was in a different part of town, far enough away from Elm Street to feel somewhat removed from the haunting memories, but close enough that the shadows of the past still seemed to reach them. John couldn't shake the feeling that they were still being watched. The intruder's face haunted his dreams, and the tapping sound lingered in his mind. He felt a growing sense of dread that their nightmare was far from over. One night, as the family sat down for dinner, John heard the faint tapping sound again. He looked around, but no one else seemed to notice. Trying to brush it off as his imagination, he forced himself to focus on the conversation at the table. After dinner, he took a walk around the neighborhood, hoping to clear his mind. The quiet streets and friendly faces were a stark contrast to the terror he felt inside. As he passed a dark alley, he heard the tapping again, louder and more insistent. He turned to look, but saw nothing. Get a grip, John, he muttered to himself, trying to shake off the fear. But as he continued walking, he felt a cold chill run down his spine. He quickened his pace, eager to get back to the relative safety of Ellen's house. That night, John had a vivid nightmare. He was back in the basement, facing the intruder. The man's cold, empty eyes bored into him, and the tapping sound grew deafening. John tried to run, but his feet felt like they were stuck in quicksand. The intruder's sinister laughter echoed in his ears as he struggled to wake up. When he finally did, he was drenched in sweat, his heart racing. Sarah stirred beside him, her eyes filled with concern. Another nightmare? She asked softly. John nodded, unable to find the words to describe the terror he felt. I can't shake it, Sarah. It's like he's still here, watching us. We need to find a way to move on, 
Sarah said, her voice firm but gentle. We can't let him control our lives. The next day, they decided to visit their old house on Elm Street. They needed to face their fears and find some closure. As they approached the house, the memories of that night came flooding back. The broken window, the intruders, the terror they felt, it was all still so vivid. Inside, the house was eerily silent. The air felt heavy, as if it was still holding on to the fear and violence that had occurred within its walls. They walked through each room, trying to make peace with what had happened. In the basement, the hidden door and passageway were just as John remembered. He felt a cold chill as he approached the small, underground room where he had confronted the intruder. The tapping sound returned, echoing through the confined space. John, we need to leave, Sarah said, her voice trembling. This place is haunted. We can't stay here. John nodded, but as they turned to leave, the hidden door slammed shut, trapping them inside. The tapping grew louder, more frantic, and the air grew colder. Shadows moved along the walls, coalescing into the figure of the intruder. You can't escape me, the intruder hissed, his eyes glowing with malevolence. The darkness is eternal. Panic surged through John as he tried to force the door open, but it wouldn't budge. The intruder advanced, his sinister smile never leaving his face. I told you I would be back, he said, his voice echoing with an otherworldly resonance. John and Sarah huddled together, their fear palpable. The tapping sound became deafening, and the shadows seemed to close in around them. Just as the intruder reached out to grab them, a bright light filled the room. John shielded his eyes, and when he looked again, the intruder was gone. The tapping had stopped, and the hidden door was open. They stumbled out of the passageway, their hearts pounding. Outside, the sun was setting, casting long shadows over the house. They knew they couldn't stay there any longer. They had to leave Pleasant Grove and start anew, far away from the darkness that had invaded their lives. That night, as they packed their belongings, John heard the faint tapping one last time. He knew it was a reminder that the darkness was always lurking, waiting for the right moment to strike. They couldn't let it control them, but they also couldn't forget what had happened. The Thompsons moved to a new town, far from Pleasant Grove, hoping to find peace and safety. They attended therapy sessions and leaned on each other for support, trying to rebuild their lives. But the memories of that night, and the terror they had endured, would always be with them. They knew that the darkness was still out there, watching and waiting. And though they had escaped, the shadow of fear and violence hung over them, a constant reminder that safety could be shattered in an instant. The nightmare had ended, but its echoes would never truly fade, leaving them forever changed by the horror they had endured. In the early spring of 2016, the tranquil town of Ridgewood, Oregon, was jolted by a series of home invasions. These were not your typical break-ins. They were meticulously planned and executed, leaving little evidence behind and causing widespread fear among the residents. One such harrowing incident involved the Carter family, who had moved to Ridgewood from Seattle in search of a quieter, safer life. Mike Carter was a software engineer who worked from home, while his wife, Laura, managed a local bakery their daughter, Lily, was a bright and cheerful 10-year-old who loved reading and playing outside. They lived in a cozy two-story house on a quiet cul-de-sac, surrounded by friendly neighbors and well-kept lawns. For the Carters, Ridgewood had been everything they hoped for, until one terrifying night changed everything. It was a cool, breezy Friday evening in March. The Carters had just finished dinner and were settling into their usual evening routine. Mike was in his home office working on a project while Laura and Lily watched a movie in the living room. The sounds of laughter and the occasional rustle of popcorn filled the house, masking the approaching danger. Around 9 p.m., Laura decided to make some tea. She left Lily engrossed in the movie and walked to the kitchen. As she filled the kettle with water, she noticed something strange out of the corner of her eye, a shadow moving past the window. She brushed it off as a trick of the light or a stray animal and continued with her task. A few minutes later, the power went out, plunging the house into darkness. Laura's heart skipped a beat. Ridgewood rarely experienced power outages, and this felt different, more sinister. She called out to Mike, her voice trembling slightly. Mike, did you do something with the power? No, I didn't touch anything, 
he replied, his voice coming from the hallway. I'll check the fuse box. Mike grabbed a flashlight from the kitchen drawer and headed to the basement, where the fuse box was located. As he descended the stairs, the beam of light flickered, casting eerie shadows on the walls. He reached the fuse box and opened it, but everything seemed normal. Suddenly, he heard a faint noise, footsteps coming from upstairs. Laura, is that you? He called out, but there was no answer. Panic began to set in. Mike hurried back upstairs, calling out for Laura and Lily. When he reached the living room, he found Laura standing in the doorway, her face pale with fear. Lily was nowhere to be seen. Laura, where's Lily? Mike asked, his voice urgent. She was right here, Laura replied, her eyes wide with terror. I just turned my back for a second, and then the power went out. They frantically searched the house, calling Lily's name, but there was no response. The darkness seemed to close in around them, amplifying their fear. As Mike reached the front door, he noticed it was slightly ajar. His heart sank. Laura, the door. Someone's been in here, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Just then, they heard a muffled cry coming from upstairs. They rushed to Lily's room, where they found her huddled in the corner, her hands tied and a piece of duct tape over her mouth. She was shaking with fear, her eyes wide and filled with tears. Mike quickly untied her and removed the tape, pulling her into a tight embrace. It's okay, sweetheart. We're here. You're safe now, he whispered, trying to reassure her. But Lily's terror was palpable. Daddy, there was a man. He said if I screamed, he would hurt you and mommy, she sobbed. Laura held Lily close, her own tears streaming down her face. Did you see where he went, Lily? She asked gently. Lily shook her head. No, he just disappeared when you came in. Mike's mind raced. How had the intruder gotten in and out without them noticing? He knew they needed to call the police immediately. He reached for his phone, but the signal was dead. The intruder had cut the power and the phone lines. Laura, we need to get out of here. We need to find help, Mike said, his voice urgent. They grabbed their coats and rushed to the car, their hearts pounding with fear. As they drove away from the house, Mike kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the intruder following them. They reached the nearest police station, where they recounted their harrowing ordeal to the officers on duty. The police immediately dispatched units to the house and the surrounding area, but the intruder was nowhere to be found. The Carters were taken to a safe location while the investigation began. The next few days were a blur of police interviews and sleepless nights. The Carters couldn't shake the feeling that they were still being watched, that the intruder might come back. The police conducted a thorough investigation, but the intruder had left no trace. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. As the weeks passed, the Carters tried to regain a sense of normalcy, but the fear lingered. They installed a state-of-the-art security system and reinforced the doors and windows, but the sense of vulnerability was hard to shake. Lily had trouble sleeping and would often wake up crying, haunted by nightmares of the intruder. One evening, as Mike was reviewing the security footage from their newly installed cameras, he noticed something strange. In one of the clips, taken from the camera at the back of the house, a shadowy figure could be seen moving through the yard. The figure paused for a moment, looking directly at the camera, before disappearing into the darkness. Mike's blood ran cold. He showed the footage to Laura, who gasped in horror. Mike, that's him. That's the man who was in our house, she said, her voice trembling. They immediately called the police, who arrived within minutes. The officers reviewed the footage and began a search of the area, but once again, the intruder was nowhere to be found. It was as if he was taunting them, letting them know that he was still out there, watching. The Carters knew they couldn't live in constant fear. They decided to move, hoping that a fresh start in a new town would help them heal. They found a house in a quiet neighborhood a few hours away and began the process of moving. On their last night in Ridgewood, as they finished packing, Mike heard the faint tapping sound again. He froze, his heart pounding. He turned to Laura, who had also heard it. They both knew what it meant. The intruder was back. Mike, we need to leave. Now, Laura said, her voice filled with fear. They grabbed Lily and rushed to the car, not bothering to lock the door behind them. As they drove away, Mike glanced back at the house one last time. In the rearview mirror, he saw the shadowy figure standing in the doorway, watching them leave. The Carters moved into their new home, hoping to leave the nightmare behind. 
They installed a comprehensive security system and took every precaution to ensure their safety. But the fear and trauma followed them, a constant reminder of the night their lives were shattered. Lily continued to struggle with nightmares, and both Mike and Laura found it difficult to sleep, always listening for that faint tapping sound. They attended therapy sessions and tried to rebuild their lives, but the sense of being watched never truly left them. One night, several months after the move, Mike was awakened by a familiar noise, the tapping sound. His heart raced as he got out of bed and checked the security footage. There, on the screen, was the shadowy figure standing at the edge of their yard, looking directly at the camera. Mike woke Laura, his voice shaking. He's here, he's found us. They called the police, but by the time the officers arrived, the intruder was gone. The fear and dread returned, more intense than ever. The Carters knew they couldn't keep running, but they didn't know how to make the terror stop. As the months turned into years, the Carters lived in a state of constant vigilance, always looking over their shoulders, always listening for that faint tapping sound. The intruder was never caught, and the fear he had instilled in them became a permanent part of their lives. And though they tried to move on, the shadow of that night in Ridgewood always lingered, a chilling reminder that safety could be shattered in an instant. The nightmare had ended, but its echoes would never truly fade, leaving them forever changed by the horror they had endured. The Carters tried to maintain a semblance of normalcy in their new home, but the sense of security they once knew was gone. Every night, they lay awake, listening for any unusual sounds, dreading the possibility of the intruder's return. Their new town, though friendly and peaceful, couldn't erase the trauma that haunted them. One rainy evening in late October, Mike was sitting in this his home office, reviewing some work documents. The steady patter of rain against the windows was almost soothing, but then he heard it, a faint tapping sound. His heart raced as he checked the security monitors. The yard was empty, but the sound persisted. He called out to Laura, who was in the kitchen preparing dinner. Laura, do you hear that? Laura paused, listening. The tapping grew louder, more insistent. Mike, it's happening again, she said, her voice trembling. Mike grabbed the baseball bat he kept by his desk and cautiously moved through the house, checking each room. Laura followed, holding a large kitchen knife. They reached Lily's room, where she was playing with her dolls, unaware of the growing tension. Lily, come with us, Laura said, trying to keep her voice calm. They gathered in the living room, the tapping now echoing through the entire house. Suddenly the lights flickered and went out, plunging them into darkness. The rain intensified, thunder rumbling in the distance. Mike turned on his flashlight and shone it around the room. The beam caught something moving outside the window, a shadowy figure standing in the yard, watching them. He's here, Mike whispered, his grip tightening on the bat. The figure moved closer, and the tapping sound seemed to come from all directions. The front door rattled, as if someone was trying to force it open. The carters huddled together, their fear palpable. Call the police, Mike said to Laura, his voice urgent. Laura dialed 911 with shaking hands, her voice trembling as she explained the situation. The operator assured her that help was on the way, but the minutes felt like hours. The door burst open with a crash, and the shadowy figure stepped inside, his face obscured by a hood. You thought you could escape me? He hissed, his voice cold and menacing. Mike stepped forward, brandishing the bat. Get out of my house! He shouted, his voice filled with both fear and anger. The intruder laughed, a chilling sound that echoed through the room. You can't stop me. You belong to the darkness now. He lunged at Mike, who swung the bat with all his strength. The intruder dodged the blow and grabbed Laura, pulling her close and holding a knife to her throat. Drop the bat or she dies, he growled. Mike froze, his heart pounding. He dropped the bat, his eyes locked on the intruder. Please, just let her go, he pleaded. The intruder smiled, a cruel, twisted grin. It's too late for that. Suddenly, the room was filled with bright lights and the sound of sirens. The police had arrived. The intruder hesitated, his grip on Laura loosening. Mike seized the opportunity and tackled him to the ground. They struggled, the intruder's knife slicing Mike's arm, but Mike managed to pin him down as the police stormed in and pulled the intruder off him. The intruder was handcuffed and taken away, 
his eyes never leaving Mike's. This isn't over, he hissed as he was led out the door. The police took statements and assured the Carters that the intruder would be behind bars for a long time, but the fear remained, the sense of being watched never truly leaving them. That night as they tried to sleep, the tapping sound returned, fainter but still there, a chilling reminder of the darkness that had invaded their lives. Mike and Laura lay awake, holding each other tightly, knowing that the nightmare wasn't over. The intruder's threat echoed in their minds, a constant reminder that safety was an illusion. And though they had survived the ordeal, the fear and trauma would forever be a part of them, a shadow that followed them wherever they went. As the days turned into weeks, the Carters did their best to move on, but the memories of that night haunted their every waking moment. They knew that the darkness was still out there, watching and waiting, ready to strike again. The tapping sound continued, a sinister reminder that the terror was never truly over and that the intruder's promise of revenge hung over them like a dark cloud, forever changing their lives and leaving them trapped in a never-ending nightmare. Thank you for listening. Now watch this video, 